as we'll uh, begin with uh, the Lord, whose glory is uh, out there in the universe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. You are manifest in the microcosm and the macrocosm, of this universe and everything in it. And we ask you, Lord, to, uh, to bless this talk this, this evening and all the people who are listening to it. Help us not only to keep this information for ourselves, but uh, to share it with others who may be in uh, real need of uh, some help uh, to shore up their faith. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon uh, me and all those who are listening to it, uh, that together we may see not only your intelligence in all of this, but also see your loving and divinely providential hand uh, guiding us to fruition in you. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to pray through the intercession of Father George Lanature. So, um, the, the, the nice little Belgian priest who discovered the Big Bang Theory. What I wanted to do tonight is just to be a, uh, since about half of you uh, were not here for the last talk, um, just a, a really brief overview of where, what we did last time because it leads into what we're going to do this time. And uh, let me just uh, start off by, by mentioning this website for just one minute. Um, that mondacenter.com. Um, there is a whole lot of stuff on that mm -hmm. website that's free of charge, <clears throat> which of course all students like that. And um, uh, the key thing is there's a workbook on there. Um, it's called From Nothing to Cosmos Workbook. Um, a lot of the concepts that I have gone over, you can see it all in print. It's about a 120 page workbook, it's all there. You just click on that free workbook and you can just go right down the table of contents to wherever you want to go. There's also a free video that has elaborations of some of the things uh, we've talked about on it as well. And that's modgetcenter.com. And just, there's, there's four different areas, uh, four different landing pages. The landing page you want for these lectures is called Faith, Science, and Reason. So let's uh, uh, quickly just sort of survey where we came last time. Uh, we're saying last time that this is the best century uh, you could, not just the best century, it's the best decade you could possibly live in if you want evidence for the existence of God. Uh, why so? Uh, because of three principal areas that uh, come from, uh, mostly from physics. So this is not going to be really chemistry or biology here. Uh, this is mostly going to be cosmology, astrophysics, and physics uh, itself, but uh, elementary particle physics. Uh, the first area is what we'll call space-time geometry proofs. I'll briefly review it in a moment. The second area is entropy, and the third area is anthropic coincidences. Obviously, since I spent the whole time last time going over these three points, I'm not going to be able to go over them very much tonight, except by way of review. But what I want to say, though, is you can get those whole things right off the website, in the free videos, the free workbook. Just go there. All of these things that are, are explained. Uh, Space-time geometry proofs are, are a remarkable are a thing. Um, they're proofs of a beginning. And, and uh, it so happens that because of the dynamic nature of space-time, you can actually make predictions, or in this case, proofs or theorems uh, about a beginning, not only of our universe, but you can also prove uh, the necessity for a beginning of a multiverse, and even the necessity of an, a beginning of an oscillating universe, even a universe in the higher dimensional space of string theory. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this tonight, uh, but the most important proof to be aware of, and uh, Ken, you can get this off the, the videos on the website, mindcenter.com, is called the Board of Alenkin Guth proof, uh, the BVG proof from 2003. Uh, this is an incredibly important uh, proof uh, of the beginning of our universe because it actually comes very close to presenting a beginning of physical reality itself. Uh, Arvind Borda was the former director of the Cavalry Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Alexander Valenkin is the current director of the Institute of Cosmology at Tufts University in Boston. 
And Ellen Guth has the High Chair of Cosmology at MIT and in Boston. And um, these three guys got together and developed perhaps the most elegant and the best argument for a beginning of all of these different configurations. Not just our universe, but bouncing universes, multiverses, higher dimensional space stream universes, etc. And, and this proof, uh, you can look at it, it's, it's done in five logical steps in the proof. Or if you want the math, you can just go. Uh, we have Alexander Vilenkin delivering his lecture uh, there at Cambridge University on Stephen Hawking's 70th birthday. And the lecture is why cosmologists cannot escape a beginning. And of course, Lisa Grossman for the New York Times, as I said uh, last month, I called it the worst birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, uh, he does give the math, so those of you who like the, the, that sort of thing, uh, there it is. Uh, we do the thing logically, and it can be done logically. Uh, Vilenkin himself has done it, and all I did was copy it, you know, and put it into simple steps. But the, the point is that we're, we've gotten to very close anyway. Not that we haven't gotten to it yet, but we've gotten very close to the beginning of physical reality itself. Because even if there was a period prior to our Big Bang, and there's, by the way, there's no necessity that there should be such a period prior to our Big Bang 13.8 uh, billion years ago. But even if there had been such a period, that period too would have had to have had a beginning. And of course, that's the significance of the Board of Lincoln Group Theorem or Proof, because it's showing even if we're just one little bubble universe in a multiverse, the multiverse has to have a beginning. Even if our universe had all kinds of cycles prior to our Big Bang, expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting, and the, the, since the Big Bang is only one expansion since all of that cycling, even all of that cycling and that bouncing would have had to have had a beginning. And even if there is a stream interference, by the way, there's no, absolutely no evidence for any kind of higher dimensional space stream universe. In fact, Roger Penrose and a lot of other people are challenging this very, very heavily. And there's a, there's a new article that just came out uh, a few days ago uh, by uh, a couple of uh, guys as well that just is beginning to, to, to cast a lot of doubt on the possibility of higher dimensional space uh, you know, um, uh, uh, stream universes. But uh, be that as it may, even if there were one, it too would have to have a beginning according to the BVG proof. And that's something we want to make sure people know about. Because if they don't know about it, then they might be thinking that someone like Richard Dawkins, who is not a physicist, actually knows what he's talking about <laughs> when he says that the universe doesn't need a beginning. And he doesn't know what he's talking about. And this is a problem. I might also point out that, you know, Stephen Hawking has been very, very severely challenged uh, in his book called, you know, The, the Grand Design, or uh, The Grand Design, uh, because he left out the board of Lincoln and Guth proof. And frankly, <coughs> that's not very intellectually honest. And. Uh, I'm just going to leave you with the conclusion of Alexander Vilenkin um, at the end, you know, in 2006, after he has kind of demonstrated this. His final conclusion, which I gave to you last month, was as follows. It is said that a good argument will convince a reasonable person, and that a proof will convince even an unreasonable one. Well, now that the proof is in place, namely the Board of Vilenkin and Guth proof, now that the proof is in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind even the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They must confront the reality of a beginning. Now I'm going to talk about the significance of a beginning in a moment, but entropy evidence, just the main thing to remember about entropy, and again, you can get all the steps in, in the entropy evidence, is the first thing to know about entropy is it's vastly applicable. Just like the Board of Lincoln Guth proof is vastly applicable, not only to physical structures like our universe, 
but physical structures that go way beyond our universe, like hypothetical multiverses, or hypothetical bouncing universes, hypothetical string universes, and so forth. It's very, very difficult to escape the second law of thermodynamics. And right now, all of the conventional evidence seems to suggest that entropy requires a beginning, not only of our universe, but of multiverses and so forth. Now, there are people like Sean Carroll who try to invent multiverses, which are really, really esoteric, very highly hypothetical multiverses to try and obviate entropy. But you have to have all kinds of little quadrants of the sitter space that get this, go backwards in time in order to make that result <coughs> happen. Now, when you start suggesting that you know you've got to have quadrants, special quadrants of a special kind of space and that has to go backwards in time in order to get your multiverse to avoid entropy. Most physicists start saying, uh, Sean, this is not physically realistic. We, we just, the backward time deal just doesn't really jive that well. And so there's generally a real suspicion of these kinds of, of what I would call esoteric explanations, which are patently just attempts to get out of the BBG proof, but really don't, out of the entropy evidence, but really don't succeed very well. So uh, I'll just take my word for it, you know, the entropy evidence does suggest strongly a beginning of the universe, but I'm not going to repeat uh, all of that. Uh, the third area that, that we uh, investigated, oh, uh, uh, let me just uh, stop for a moment. Remember why a beginning of physical reality is so important. Remember, the board of light and good proof doesn't just point to a beginning of our universe, and the entropy evidence doesn't just point to the beginning of our universe. The board of light and good proof, the entropy evidence point to a beginning of other universal configurations, like multiverses, bouncing universes, string universes, etc. So what these two kinds of evidence are pointing to is it pointing to evidence of a beginning of physical reality itself, no matter what the condition it might have been was, <laughs> multiverse, etc. And that's very interesting. Because if we're at that point, let's go through the three steps again. If you're at the beginning of physical reality, then you're at the beginning of physical time. Before the beginning of physical time, there is no before. There's no physical time, literally. So what we can say is, is that before the beginning, a completely hypothetical state, before the beginning of physical reality, physical reality was literally nothing. It did not exist. And its time did not exist. The idea of before the beginning can only be hypothetical because there was no physical time. Number two, if nothing can only do nothing, and I hope you will agree with me that nothing can only, remember the song from Nothing Only Nothing Can Come. It's a great song because it's pretty much right. If nothing can only do nothing, then last step, then before the beginning of physical reality, when physical reality was nothing and could only do nothing, it could not have moved itself from nothing to something. And if it could not have moved itself from nothing to something, because it could only do nothing, then something else, trans-physical, trans-universal, would have to have so moved it. And that's the main key thing. The something that's transphysical and transuniversal has to literally create it out of nothing, ex nihilo. This is the point we are currently at. And if we if are respectful of some of these esoteric theories, I think we should always be respectful of all esoteric theories. But let's face facts. Some of them are really out there, and it really takes a lot more, you know, <laughs> I would have to say, suspension of good human judgment 
to believe in some of these things than to believe in God. But that's another matter. The point I'm trying to get to is, right now, we're at a really interesting point in our universal development. Second thought. We go to the, or the third um, uh, area of evidence. These are the anthropic coincidences. And what we're showing here is not a beginning of the universe or even the existence of a creator that's transphysical, right? That's beyond the universe or beyond physics. Here we're looking at the intelligence of, of the creator it, itself. And last time we gave a series of examples of this. Uh, one of them was the low entropy of our universe at the Big Bang. Recall for just a moment that it's really significant that we start with the Big Bang because then no one can argue to a previous natural cause. You always get in trouble if you try and start, you know, five billion, 10 billion years down, as it were, the age of the universe, you know, and then all of a sudden you say, you know, God had to move A to B to get from step A to B 10 million years down the line. Why? Because someone could say, well, there could have been some other natural cause we don't even understand. And, and you're just making this leap. You're just inferring this because the causes we know today don't explain it. But the great part about starting with the Big Bang is there wasn't a prior natural cause. That's the problem. Anything which existed before, the, and there could have been a physical reality prior to the Big Bang. But I assure you of this, it was causally disconnected from the universe, an oscillating universe. The cycle that it, let's suppose it was a cycle previously, and it, and it collapsed it upon itself into a big crunch. After the big crunch and then the, the re-explosion of the universe, after that singularity, there's, it's completely causally disconnected. Our universe is causally disconnected from other bubble universes. If there were a multiverse, it'd be causally disconnected. If there was some strange quantum universe prior to that, uh, to the Big Bang, it's constantly disconnected. What, what is this? Why is that so important? Essentially, because you can't make an appeal to a natural cause. It's really hard to do, and so a lot of physicists are very convinced that this kind of argument is the best kind of argument for at least showing the intelligence of a creator um, you know, that throws the, exist of the universe into existence or a multiverse into existence out of nothing. Okay, what are some of the difficulties or some of these anthropic coincidences? Low entropy is a big one. And low entropy, for those of you who were here last time, remember, low entropy is highly improbable. Low entropy is a state of order in our universe. It's order which is necessary for any physical system to do any useful work. Now, if that order is not present in the universe, then of course no work can be done by any physical system. It's what we call a heat-dead universe. It's not gonna do anything. Now, the key thing is this. As entropy, you know, if you look at the odds of having low entropy or high order versus having high entropy, which is very low order, high entropy is much, 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 much more probable than low entropy. In fact, this <laughs> physicist, Roger Penrose, did a little calculation that we talked about last time. It's called the Penrose number. He actually calculated the odds against low entropy in our universe at the Big Bang. It's 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123 to 1 against, a double exponent. Now, if you, as I said last time, if you actually took that and made it a single exponent, it'd be 10, and then in the exponent you'd have a 1 followed by 123 zeros. So the exponent would be a trillion, 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 trillion. Now, if you wrote that number out without an exponent, with every zero being about 10 point type, our solar system would not be able to hold that number. It's the same odds, as I said last time, 
of a monkey typing the entire corpus of Shakespeare perfectly by random tapping of the keys in a single try. <laughs> no kidding. You really think low entropy occurred at the Big Bang by pure chance? I don't know any reputable physicist that thinks so. There's only two kinds of explanations you can have. Either a multiverse or God. I mean, like a super smart God. That's it. So only two options. Now, the multiverse, you can see how that works, right? The multiverse is going to cough out a new bubble universe every couple of seconds, right? Of course, you, 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 every time you cough out a new bubble universe, you get a new set of constants, you get a new set of, uh, you get a new try at low entropy. And finally, maybe after 10 to the 10 to the 123 bubble universes, finally, one universe like ours pops out. Okay. It's possible. That's one explanation, but we'll see there's some inherent weaknesses in the multiverse. And then, of course, um, that's one problem. But let's suppose the multiverse does not explain this. Then what's left is a really smart God, period. Number two is really important. We talked about constants. There are 20 numbers in our universe which are called constants. These numbers control all the laws of physics and therefore <clears throat> all the laws of nature and control the way the universe is. Again, these numbers occurred at the Big Bang. Again, like, like entropy, those constants could have had any value <clears throat> within a huge window at the Big Bang. But it so happens that they had just the values they needed to have in order for life to occur in our universe. So very quickly, just give you a couple of examples and, and, and you, can, you can get the point. But again, it's taking place at the Big Bang. Notice again the same conditions. It could have been otherwise. There's nothing about our constants that are necessary at all. It could have been any number. So of course, uh, we, you know, I think you know some of the constants, like the speed of light constant, right, 300,000 kilometers per second. I think you also know, you know, a few other things, um, uh, like maybe Planck's constant, the Hubble constant, the cosmological constant. Well, uh, our, we have four forces in our universe, right? Uh, and, and each of them have a constant. So you have the electromagnetic force, and that has three constants, the mass of the proton, mass of the electron, electromagnetic charge. You have the strong nuclear force, which has a strong nuclear force coupling constant. You have the weak force, which has the weak force constant. The gravitational force, which has a gravitational force constant. So now all these uh, different constants, you've got about 20 of these guys. The one thing to remember is they could have been almost anything higher or lower at the Big Bang, their values. But if they were even just slightly variant from the values they have, Honestly, life would be impossible as we know. A couple of the big ones I gave last time, and this should suffice. I, I, I was talking about gravitational constant and a weak force constant. Alter it by one part in 10 to the 50th, higher or lower, from the values that they just happen to have at the Big Bang. One part in 10 to the 50th, a decimal point 49 zeros and a one, higher or lower, and Either the, if you did that, either the universe would have been continuously exploding in its expansion, right? It would just have been these huge mega explosions that continue to this very day as the universe is expanding, which would be very, very bad for life forms. Alternatively, if the universe were just slightly lower in those two constants by a factor of one part in 10 to the 50th, then the universe would have literally collapsed into a black hole where the entire mass energy of the universe is being collapsed into 10 to the minus 33 centimeters with almost infinite crushing capacity, which is equally bad for life. <laughs> the point I'm trying to get to is, you mean, as I said last time, we averted complete cosmological disaster by one part in 10 to the 50th in these two constants at the Big Bang? Yep. So I'm saying? 
do you think that this happened by pure chance? No more than I think that the monkey could type Shakespeare in a single try by random tapping of the keys by pure chance. I don't think so, no, I don't. I mean, the same thing holds true, right? If you alter the electromagnetic charge, the mass of the proton, the mass of the electron, and the gravitational force constant, you just alter it by one part in 10 to the 39. Every star in our universe is a blue giant, incinerating everything. Or every star in our universe is a red dwarf, in which case everything freezes. All very bad for life forms. Mm -hmm. These constants have to be so precisely inscribed in, 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 or the values of the constants have to be so precisely inscribed at the Big Bang. It's just that the variance permitted is so little. Otherwise, the universe is hostile to life. Otherwise, the universe has no uh, amount of work energy uh, potential uh, at, at, at the Big Bang to sustain and maintain and develop life. For all intents and purposes, there's only two options. You can't believe this happened by pure chance. No one does. Not even Hawking does. It's the multiverse or it's God. Take your pick. Here's the problem with the multiverse. Not only does it have to have a beginning according to the board of Blanket and Gutenberg, but the multiverse has to have fine tuning. All known models and configurations of a multiverse, all of them require substantial amounts of fine tuning, that is to say that, that their constants and their entropy and their parameters at their beginning have to be very finely tuned for life. And all of them that have to have that fine tuning, that fine tuning is unexplained. That's the problem. At their beginning, the Linde inflationary fractal multiverse, has to have fine tuning in its initial constants, parameters, and conditions. If it doesn't, they're gonna have collisions of bubble universes, very bad for life forms in the multiverse. The point I'm trying to get to is, there is an absolute insufficiency of explanatory power in the multiverse. If physicists cannot get around the need for fine-tuning of the multiverse, then I think there's only one reasonable option left. A highly intelligent God. And we left last time with the quote of Sir Fred Hoyle, and we'll move on to the new material now. And that was, of course, his great, you know, proclamation. You know, Sir Fred Hoyle was the great atheist of physics for about decades. One day, he was not able to explain one of these anthropic coincidences, and he came out with this. He said, I don't think there are any blind forces worth speaking about in the universe. It seems to me that some super calculating, super intellect has monkeyed with the constants of physics and those of chemistry and biology as well. I consider this to be beyond the pale of a doubt. No. There we are. That's where we stand. Not only at the implications of a creator of physical reality itself, but a really, really intelligent one at that. Now that's interesting. Now we're going to get to Dawkins' objection tonight, and so we're just going to proceed uh, to our next. And here's our final conclusion. At the very least, where physical evidence is pointing to today, it is that it's just as reasonable and responsible to be a believer in an intelligent creator as not to be a believer in intelligent creation. And I think the reason is twofold. The vast applicability of the Board of Lincoln Guth proof and the vast applicability of the entropy evidence, number one. And number two, the requirement for fine-tuning of the multiverse seems, in my view, to push the evidence in the direction of an intelligent creator rather than in the other naturalistic direction which does not have a full explan explanation of not only our fine-tuning of our universe but the fine-tuning of the multiverse itself. So that's kind of where we left off. Now tonight, 
we're going to um, just discuss a few things. We're going to depart from physics for a few moments to discuss um, near-death experiences because uh, this is a very important uh, piece of evidence that has been uh, very well studied now by several different medical studies. And so we're going to talk uh, a, a lot about those studies for a bit here and talk about some of the evidence and some of the conclusions that you can come to. But why is this important? Because materialism today is kind of running rampant. I mean, everybody really is thinking out there, honestly. People are going around saying, you know, materialism is the most logical point of view, and you should reduce yourself to a bunch of atoms and molecules, because that's what we really know about ourselves. Now, there's no doubt that material existence is very easy to see, but material existence is not easily explained. And the second thing is, there's a lot of evidence for transmateriality in human beings. I'm just going to mention a few things, but the near-death experience is where we're going to concentrate tonight, because I think that has a, a very important uh, uh, a, a new area of, of discovery. The second area we're just going to quickly talk about is why are scientists atheists anyway, and just uh, you know see if there's any more validity to scientific atheism uh, than any other kind of atheism. So hold on to that for a moment. It's a, it's a valid question. There are scientists out there who are uh, very, very outspoken who are talking about their atheism. We need to redress that. The third thing that I think we, we really want to get into uh, is this whole area of, of the Bible and science. Because there are a lot of people out there um, who think that there is a, a conflict between the Bible and science. And, and there's a, a twofold problem with that. It really, scientific people think that they can't believe in the Bible, and, and really biblically oriented people think they shouldn't do anything with science. And, and both of those opinions are so horribly wrong. Because remember, reason and faith can't contradict one another, said St. Thomas Aquinas, because they come from the same source, God. So for all intents and purposes, these should be consistent, and indeed they are. And we're, I'm just going to talk about, I know some of you are not Catholic, but for, uh, I just, uh, I'm going to give a Catholic explanation of it from a papal encyclical called Divino Afflante Spiritu. The next topic we just want to approach is evolution. Again, very important topic. There are a lot of people out there who think that evolution conflicts with religion and conflicts with the Bible. From the Catholic point of view, it does not accept one kind of evolutionary theory, what's called strict materialistic Darwinism. We'll distinguish that and talk about that as a separate issue. But aside from that, evolution and religion, or evolution and transcendent explanation for our universe, or evolution and the Bible are very, very consistent with one another. Um, at least, again, in the Catholic viewpoint, we'll talk about why. Finally, of course, we need to talk about aliens. Because <coughs> there's much talk <coughs> excuse me, about aliens out there. And we want to just <coughs> take a quick check at, um, okay, what are the odds that there's life out there? And what are the odds that there's even intelligent life out there? And what are the requirements for intelligent life out there? And what do you do if there really is intelligent life out there? So we have to take a look at all that, and of course, the, all of these thoughts about UFOs and, and, and so forth uh, that are out there. Well, let's proceed to our first topic, and that's going to be this whole area of, of near-death experiences. Now, of course, um, uh, 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 oh, I think so. Uh, talk about that very first area tonight, and that's that near-death experiences. Yeah, sorry, am I messing up the PowerPoint? Oh, that's good. good. Okay, let's talk about near-death experiences. First, beware, 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 beware of anecdotal evidence for near-death experiences and a lot of really bad agendas. There are a lot of people out there who are really hucksters, uh, who, you know, for whatever reason, want to project themselves as great spiritual uh, gurus, and they use near-death experiences 
uh, to give themselves a kind of a title and to sell a lot of books. And, and, and so it, the, the, the whole area is rife with frauds, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, I, I probably, I, I trust, I, I would say that, that you know, 20% of, of these accounts, you know, are just filled with, you know, some kind of an agenda that, that's not genuine. So, so what can we do to glean the right kind of evidence uh, from near-death experiences? Stick with the science. Go only to peer-reviewed journals. Peer-reviewed journals that have longitudinal studies that are talk, we're talking here about at least 500 patients or more in multiple hospitals with very important controls um, you know, and, and what we call control groups to make sure that, you know, you have people who didn't have a near-death experience, people who did have a near-death experience, et cetera, et cetera, in the control group, and other various factors are accounted for, hopefully done by medical teams associated with a reputable university. If you have that, and you have over 500 patients in those strictly controlled environments, <laughs> you can be pretty sure that you're going to get some excellent data from that. And you don't. No one has to be reliant on anecdotal evidence. Now, I have nothing against, you know, heaven is for real or something like that. I mean, I have no, nothing against. If that is a nice, inspiring thing, it's a nice, inspiring thing. But it isn't science. And, and, and it, it, it shouldn't be passed off as that. And, and the authors there didn't want to pass it off as that. It was just an experience that was written about. I have nothing against it, but let's not use that as the foundation point uh, for a, at least a, an attempt at being objective about the evidence. Okay, now uh, what are some of the important studies uh, that are out there? Let me just give a few of them. Uh, in just uh, last year, uh, Samuel Parnia uh, did a huge study uh, at the University of Southampton in 2014, uh, and he had 2,060 patients uh, that they strictly controlled in four different countries, in 11 different hospitals. The interesting thing about the Parnia study was he did have factors that could be accounted for where they could coordinate the time sequences of what patients were seeing with various sounds in the room that could be heard by both the people in the room and could be heard by the people who were seeing during their near-death experience. I'll explain all this in a moment. But that Parnia study is a very good study. Uh, about 10% uh, of the people in that study had a full-on near-death experience, which I'm going to describe in just a moment. Some of them only had an out-of-body experience, and some of uh, them uh, you know, had kind of an entryway <clears throat> into a near-death experience, but didn't have a full near-death experience. I'll, I'll explain all this in a moment. Uh, the second one that's really important is the one uh, in, in, in Great Britain's important a medical journal, The Lancet. The Lancet published the Pim von Lommel study. It was a very, very important study. Again, highly controlled, highly monitored. We'll talk about the results a little bit later. Kenneth Ring, <coughs> Dr. Kenneth Ring and his group did a very important breakthrough study in blind people. Uh, so what, what happened with blind people during clinical death? And could they report experienced veridical data for the first time in their lives when they were born blind from birth? Uh, you'll see the data in just a moment. Absolutely remarkable the conclusions uh, were. Then uh, the Gallup uh, organization did a huge uh, nationwide study a long time ago. And that Gallup study, the statistics pretty much that they amalgamate, plus the, um, the various areas of the near-death experience that we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, those things are still confirmed. There is also a 1996 study that's not on here by Janice Holden, um, where she actually took the results of 39 different studies of near-death experiences. These were high control group longitudinal studies in hospital environments. Took 39 of these different studies, put them together, and tested the veridical evidence uh, in those studies. So there's a lot of really good ones out there. These five will do the trick to establish 
uh, pretty much some of the, uh, uh, the basis of what I'm going to maintain is that our consciousness will survive our bodily death. So let's get to uh, what uh, what it is a near-death experience. What's a full-on near-death experience versus an out-of-body experience? A near-death experience uh, generally occurs when somebody, uh, okay, for some reason uh, there's cardiac arrest. It could be caused by an automobile accident, a heart attack, drowning, whatever the case is. But 30 seconds after cardiac arrest, the brain is shutting down to a minimum because of oxygen. Uh, deprivation. When that occurs, it, it drifts toward what's called a flat EEG, where there's almost no electrical activity uh, in the cerebral cortex at that time. That means that your cognitive abilities are severely impaired. In fact, they're turned off. Uh, you're not thinking. You're not going to think a thought. Uh, no electricity, bad news uh, in the cerebral cortex. Similarly, you don't get the zero kind of flat EEG of the cerebral cortex, but in the lower brain, you do have a minimum of electrical activity, although there are some sputterings of certain uh, of, you know, uh, uh, areas of synapses in, 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 uh, you know, uh, in, in the neurons. Uh, there is a little sputtering, which indicates minimal electrical activity, but essentially fixed and dilated pupils, no gag reflex, minimal, minimal electrical activity for even, uh, you know, uh, in the beating of, of your heart or for, you know, the operation of, of uh, you know, uh, uh, breathing and things of that nature. All of that has to be done artificially. The brain at that point cannot control it, not insufficient uh, electrical activity for that. So during a period when this is occurring, Essentially, the physical body and especially the physical brain is, is essentially devoid of electricity and shut down. During that point, it seems as if some kind of, well, I'm going to call it a transphysical component, uh, you know, it's our consciousness, our consciousness and some transphysical, that is to say, beyond physics, some transphysical form leaves the body. When it leaves the body, it winds up looking at the body from a point above and a little beyond the body itself. So it's looking down on itself and all the various activities inside the operating room uh, or at the accident site or the drowning site or wherever it may be. Now, notice then that we're not just talking about a consciousness that's leaving the body, transphysical consciousness, but there's transphysical sight, which of course, as uh, Kenneth Ring, Dr. Kenneth Ring calls mind sight. There's transphysical hearing, ability to hear. There's also a transphysical memory. We know ourselves, we know our past memories. In addition, there is a, a transphysical a memory in the sense of I can remember what I'm seeing when I'm in a transphysical state above and beyond my body and so forth and so on. So uh, this is the first part. This constitutes what you call an out-of-body part of the experience. Now some people just stop there and nothing else happens. But in the vast majority of the cases, people leave the operating room. Now by the way, the, um, the uh, physical body that they have is not subject, uh, in the transphysical uh, consciousness they have, is not subject to, to physical laws. It can go through walls, it can go at enormous rates of speed, it can go, you know, it defies gravity, There's, so it's not subject to, to physical laws in any respect. And we'll talk about that when we get to the veridical evidence in a moment. But then, a lot of these people do move to a whole other domain. A domain that they describe as a heavenly domain, or a beautiful domain, or uh, a, splendor, uh, a, 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 a splendid domain, and, and so forth. Something is, is truly beyond the beauty of this world. It's like, uh, uh, you know, beauty squared or beauty cubed. But they're just overwhelmed with the, with the beauty of, of this place. And, and three common occurrences happen. Very frequently, they meet deceased relatives, and sometimes friends, but mostly relatives, who come to greet them. Now some of them may be, excuse me, 
for uh, trying to do this. Uh, but some of them may be relatives that um, that uh, they did not know of before. And then when they come back, they confirm, did I have an aunt so-and-so? Or, did, you know, did I have a great-grandmother so-and-so? You know, and, you know, I was greeted by so-and-so. Did I have a deceased sister that I didn't know about? So a lot of the time, um, the, the deceased relative or friend uh, is known. But sometimes they are not known. And somebody will have to explain who they are to them. Uh, that deceased relative or friend looks young. It looks like they're kind of in the prime of their lives. You know, whatever, 25, 30 years old, whatever. So, you know, even if it was an infant, they're kind of in that prime. Even if the person died at a very uh, elderly, it looks like they're in that prime. And of course, there's communication that can take place. Second common experience, a very intensely loving white light. The light is incredibly bright and beautiful, but people are not harmed by the light. And in addition to it, it is always, almost always categorized as either unconditional love or perfect love or something of that nature. So it's just a, an overwhelming experience of being loved and understood so that the, the light understands you perfectly and loves you perfectly, uh, all, very much like Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, right? The father, you know, even though he understands what this boy has done, loves him unconditionally and perfectly, this experience. Frequently, the third experience is Jesus. And this happens, like, in a lot of the cases of, of children, right? I mean, uh, there are huge numbers. But when children have cardiac arrest, about 85% of the time, they report an NDE, a full-on NDE. Adults, about 20% of the time. There's a lot of, you know, no, we're not sure why, but for sure the kids do experience, and Jesus is frequently a part of a child's NDE. Um, and, and that comes from all quadrants. So interesting sorts of things. So that's basically, then of course, there's a choice made uh, for you, or you can make the choice with either the white light or with your relatives to come back. And then, of course, you're, you're back into your body again. Okay, what, you know, besides people just reporting this subjectively, what kinds of evidence do we have that things like that actually occur? The, the first is a tremendous preponderance of, of veridical data. Veridical data is like unusual data that can be verified after the fact by an independent researcher. Okay, so it's like verifiable data. But it's not some data that could be predicted. So if a person says, oh, there was a lot of activity and people put these, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, paddles on my chest and, 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 and shocked me, and you couldn't count that because you could predict that. But if it was data that was generally non-repeatable, now that was worth something. So for example, you know, uh, you know, uh, somebody sees where their dentures are. When the whole hospital staff thinks the dentures are lost, they say, well, I saw where you put them. It's in that drawer underneath this machine, and it was the red-haired nurse that did it. And of course, you look over, there they are. You know, then he starts saying, well, okay. Or I saw the tennis shoe outside the third floor ledge of the hospital. And, uh, and it had its shoelace stuck underneath the heel, and the left toe was really worn down. And it's out there, exactly as described. There are many, many, many such experiences. Now, Janice Holden has cataloged those things. So if you're interested in looking at that, take a look at uh, the Janice Holden study from 1996. She cataloged, uh, cataloged a whole bunch of them. And we have a brand new video coming out with a whole section in that video on happy and suffering love of God, which I'll be talking about in our, my next month's thing. But in there, Holden uh, has a, a big, huge interview uh, where she talks about uh, a lot of the vertical data. But there is, here's the upshot from Holden's study. Basically, the vast majority of the time, the veridical, that's to say the unusual, generally non-repeatable 
datum reported by the person is reported 100% accurately using the strictest criteria of adherence. That's interesting. That's hard to do. I mean, any of you who are lawyers in here try to get witnesses in, the, in this world to say that and agree, you know, get 100% accuracy most of the time. Very, very difficult. So something, this is a very hard thing to repeat if they are not really seeing something that's going on. But the second thing is really important is that 80% of blind people see during clinical death. This includes people who were blind from birth and people who lost their sight at another uh, period of time. But the point is, they were blind when they were clinically dead. Their, their physical body's eyes were non-functioning when they were seeing what was going on in the room and reporting uh, veridical data. 80%. This is really hard to replicate. How do you get a person to see for the first time when they're clinically dead and report the data accurately 80% of the time if something's not happening? You can't start appealing to hallucination. Do you know the odds of, predict of having a random hallucination actually correspond to reality 100% accurately when a person's never seen before? Are you kidding me? No way. It's very hard to explain this with oxygen deprivation. Very difficult to explain this with narcotics. You know, very diff difficult to explain with temporal lobe stimulation. Very difficult to explain by some kind of random, you know, gravity impact like pilots would explain. All these things. There is a very important uh, book that's just been written by a neuroscientist by the name of Samuel Par uh, not Samuel Parney, but uh, um, by Mario uh, Beauregard. Uh, he's a neuroscientist down there at the University of Arizona, Phoenix. And it's called Brain Wars. And basically, Beauregard just goes through and takes every known physical explanation of NDEs. And he's top guy in the neuroscience field. And he just simply cans it. I mean, it just shows it's not explanatory. And it's, it's getting really interesting out there. And now you've got the materialists uh, lined up against these transphysicalists. And the transphysicalists are becoming a bigger and bigger part of not only the medical uh, population, but the neuroscience population. And it's getting real interesting. And uh, I've got a whole book on it called The Soul's Upward Yearning. And uh, it should be coming out in six months. And, you know, if, I, if my publisher can get it done. <laughs> so uh, it's not my fault. Upward yearning? The Soul's Upward Yearning. Yeah, and it, it should be out in about six months. And, it's Ignatius Presti, I'm sort of putting the pressure on. <laughs> so, but, uh, so to make a long story short, there's a really interesting uh, you know, turn of events there. The, the, the third area that's very interesting too is the lowering of death anxiety uh, in, 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 uh, in people, both in infants, I mean in children, and in um, adults. Uh, when people have a near-death experience, you can measure actually their death anxiety by giving them death stimuli to look at, you know, and normally, you know, there's, you could call it, there's, there's a, a norm in the population where people will respond to a modified polygraph with some degree of nervousness, right, when they see a, a, a death stimulus, right, but if, if you do that with somebody who's had a near-death experience, they experience no, no death anxiety. I mean, it's like not just lower than the norm in the population, it's literally almost none. And that's 30 years after they get the NDE. Something, it's like something psychological, something so profound has happened to them that they are literally transformed for the rest of their lives. Psychologically, they have no impact. However, children and adults 
who died clinically but did not have a near-death experience have a higher death anxiety than the normal population. No. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's how profound the NDE is on, on the site. But again, explanation, physical explanation, we haven't been able to control death anxiety anywhere near I mean, There's some really cool fighter pilots out there, but they still have death anxiety. <laughs> this is the only part of the population we know of. It's very interesting. Okay, next thing. Yeah, uh, the, what I just intimated, that this, this uh, Grayson and Kelly, there's a whole area of the University of Virginia Medical School, <coughs> which is devoted to NDEs right now. And it's run by this guy, Bruce uh, uh, Grayson and Amy Kelly. They're two uh, uh, really, one's a neuroscientist, the other's a doctor. And they basically have come together and tried to take a look at what happens after the fact and catalog these things statistically and, what, and so forth. You know, did people meet relatives? Did they meet friends? What did they say? How, how many times could we get some corroborating evidence from people came back with data that they couldn't have possibly known when they were younger and so forth and so on. And, and they've made a very nice study of that. That's Grayson and Kelly. And uh, again, you can see these things uh, cited. And that's the University of Virginia uh, Medical School. And it's, it's a, it's a, the area of neuroscience that is studying here of the near-death experiences. So, uh, and of course, what you have also is, is uh, these eight parts of an NDE. Uh, they're almost con consistent from study to study, nation to nation. Right, culture to culture. I mean, you have the, the tunnel experience that happens with a certain number of people. You have the, uh, the out of body experience where people are looking down, reporting vertical evidence by a certain number of people. You have, you know, uh, going to the other side, meeting the deceased relatives or the, or the, the, the white light and the beautiful domain and so forth, uh, that making the choice to come back into the body. Very <clears throat> much consistency of data from one study to the next. Uh, the upshot is simply this. I don't think there's really any reason for us today to say that we don't think there's some transphysical component of us. Now, there are a lot of naturalistic people out there who really hate this stuff. They are really battling it. But there's a lot of people out there who are really good neuroscientists and physicians who are battling right back. And, and that's that book uh, by Mario Beauregard uh, called Brain Wars. You've just got to read it. It's very interesting. But we are at a place that Dr. Kim von Lennon calls a place where science can no longer simply call us material beings. We have reached a point. Now, you can try and say quantum physics will one day explain this ability of consciousness to live on after bodily death. But I have to be honest with you. Quantum physics does not have explanatory power beyond unifying the fields that can transmit information in, in a, uh, instantaneously. Aside from that, there's nothing about intelligence or rationality that's built into any known quantum model. It's just not proportionate. It doesn't work. And then my book, The Soul's Upward Yearning, I fashion arguments against the thought of quantum theory uh, having any explicability for rational uh, visual consciousness after bodily death. Quantum models cannot do that. So for all intents and purposes, I think we have a soul. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's good evidence for it. Uh, beyond, of course, our faith and the fact that uh, uh, we've been uh, uh, given that uh, through our faith. Okay, let's just zoom for a second um, uh, to another area that I, I just do want to uh, touch upon. Why are scientists a atheists? I mean, you, you have some real outspoken guys. You know, Richard Dawkins is a good biologist. He's out there. You know, Stephen Hawking is making movies. You know, he's, he's out there. Uh, you know, there's a various, uh, you know, uh, other guys, you know, uh, uh, out there. Uh, Stanger is, of course, very, very outspoken guy. And Lawrence Krauss is out there, a uh, very outspoken guy. Uh, I'm invited every time I go to the University of Arizona to speak. 
I always invite Lawrence Cross, he never comes. <laughs> you know, and uh, as I said before, you know, I don't, uh, I, I think, you know, uh, we have to be very, very careful about, you know, attributing any more data to a scientific atheist than to any other kind uh, of atheist. But, okay, um, I'm just going to try and wind everything up in 15 here, but I'm going to open it up. I want to really get to your questions tonight for a good 45 minutes or so. So the main thing I just want to say here is that with scientific atheism, let's go back to our principles that we had before that we talked about last week. Number one, science can't disprove God. It's not possible. Why? Scientific evidence must come from within our universe. Why? Because scientific evidence must be observable. You have to have observable, measurable, testable data. Well, where are you going to get observable data? From within the universe. <clears throat> Here's the problem. God is outside, beyond the universe. Not captured by the universe. He's not, I mean, essentially, completely beyond the universe. Frankly, the best analogy is the entire universe is a thought in God's mind, not vice versa. Now, as, if you take that analogy seriously, which is the only analogy I've ever heard of, not just by the Christian church, but by metaphysicians throughout the centuries, if that's the case, how can you take evidence from within this universe to disprove a deity or an entity which is fundamentally beyond our universe? You can't do it, as I said last week, uh, last month, any more than a cartoon character assembling all of the data from the cartoon to disprove the cartoonist. It can't happen. It's not possible. It's methodologically impossible. Therefore, the idea of scientific atheism, what do you mean by that term? It's not scientifically proved atheism. It's scientists who happen to choose to be atheists. But let's take the second thing, very important that we went through last time. Science cannot show that our universe does not need a creator. It is not possible for science to do this because science is an inductive discipline. Scientists don't know what they don't know until they have discovered it. Stephen Hawking can't say that M theory is going to show that the universe doesn't need a creation for two important reasons. Number one, we don't have a scintilla of evidence that M theory is true or real. Not one scintilla. Boy, you mean you're going to invest the entire explanation of the universe in a theory for which we have no evidence? You know, a lot of mistakes have been made in the history of science when scientists went right over their skis and made claims just like this one. Because scientists can't know what they don't know until they have discovered it. Secondly, we can't possibly know whether M theory eliminates the whole of what physical reality is. How can any physicist say that M theory exhausts the whole of physical reality? How could you possibly know what exhausts the whole of physical reality until you understand the whole of physical reality, which no scientist can know before he has or she has discovered it? This is preposterous. So why? Why are scientists atheists? For the same reason any other atheist is an atheist. A personal choice, not science. Scientific atheism is not scientific, period. It's not based on science. So why do people choose atheism? Five basic reasons 
have been elucidated. The number one reason, according to Ignatius, Ignace Lepp wrote a big book called Atheism in Our Time. The number one reason is uninterpreted suffering. People might be suffering, or maybe they know someone who's suffering, or they're reading the newspaper every day, and they say the world is suffering. And they look at this suffering, and they're asking themselves, why would an all-powerful, all-loving God allow this kind of suffering in the world? If he is all-loving, why, why would he do this? And maybe that means he's not loving. Some will say, maybe that means he doesn't exist. And the ones who say, well, maybe he does exist, he's not loving, well, he's not relevant to me. And that's where they stay. Now, I'm begging you, if that question is of interest to you, Please come back next month. I intend to give one, actually, uh, in April. I will give a full, huge, boring explanation <laughs> of why that is, you know, an erroneous, what we call a false dichotomy, right? Are suffering and love really dichotomous? Do suffering and love really contradict each other? They don't. Frequently, 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 suffering can lead toward love. Frequently, suffering can shock us out of superficiality. Frequently, suffering can lead us to humility, just like St. Paul. Frequently, suffering presents the occasions for compassion. Frequent, I'm telling you, there's something here that needs to be explained to this group of atheists. And, and so, th this is the biggest group of atheists. And we as Christians, we just have to get our ducks in a row. Because there's a lot of hurting people out there who really need an explanation for their suffering so that they can then appeal to God and to His grace to help them, appeal to the Christian community and to the goodwill of the Christian community or whatever religious community, right, to, uh, uh, you know, to get help in their suffering so that, of course, instead of being separated from God in their suffering, being separated from love in their suffering, they grow in love in their suffering and they grow in faith through their suffering. We have to do a better job. I think if we did, we, we cut that number in half overnight if we've got our ducks in a row on, on, on this one. The second big reason uh, for this is probably what might be called um, the old um, Nietzschean reason for atheism. And the Nietzschean reason for atheism is pure and simple. I don't want to be subject to a moral authority outside of myself. I am me. I'm my own moral authority, and I'm my own God. Mind your own business. I don't want any gods besides me. That's Friedrich Nietzsche, right? Thus spake Zarathustra. That's the will to power, right? The whole idea of, of, of Jean Paul Sartre, right? If human beings are absolutely free, then either God doesn't exist or he doesn't have a part of, of anything that's going on in my life. <coughs> so it's the idea of absolute freedom, the idea of absolute autonomy, the absolute uh, idea of there are no other gods but me. Me. And that idea, of course, that's there. It's, it's there. There are a lot of Nietzschean atheists out there, a lot of Sartre <coughs> atheists out there. Not uncommon. Uh, Quite frankly, I think it's ill-advised. Because, you know, if we really are transcendental beings, if we really do have the desire for perfect truth, perfect love, perfect goodness and justice, perfect beauty and perfect home, if we've got these five transcendental desires, guess what, everybody? We can't satisfy ourselves. Because we're not perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. And nobody else can satisfy us as a human being. Oh no, said Sartre. If that's the case, then we're doomed. Doomed to be unsatisfied. Life is absurd, he said. We're left with despair. For the very thing that we desire is our ultimate satisfaction and fulfillment. <coughs> can never be had by us. And since God doesn't exist, life is absurd. And all we can do is despair. 
That's one thought. <laughs> or you can say the opposite. Well, what, well, wait a minute. Maybe God exists. And maybe there is a being who is perfect, then conditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being. And now that I'm thinking about it, let me put my Plato cap on and my Aristotle cap on and ask myself, where in the world did I get a desire for perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being? Because if I have a desire for perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being, I must have an awareness of perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being. But where did I get an awareness of perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being? I couldn't have gotten the awareness from outside because as I just said, there isn't any perfect truth out there. There's no perfect love out there. Will agree. There's no perfect justice out there. I hope you will agree. Perfect beauty out there. <clears throat> but I can recognize every imperfection in truth and every imperfection in beauty and love and goodness and justice. I'm a good imperfection recognizer because I have an awareness of what perfect truth is and I can recognize everything which falls in. I have an awareness of what perfect love is and I can find every imperfection in your love and my love and everybody else's love and perfect justice too. I could be outraged and just screaming, that's unfair with lower lip extended because I recognize every single manifestation of perfect uh, uh, you know, uh, unfairness over against the perfect fairness that I'm aware of. Where? Where did I ever get that idea, that sense and awareness of perfect love, truth, goodness, beauty, and home? Where did I get it if I didn't get it out in the world, if I didn't get it from my finite brain, which is still limited by algorithmically finite structures and is quite imperfect, I assure you. Where did I get it from? Maybe there is a God, and maybe God is present to me. That's what the pagan Plato concluded. Oh, I don't think that scientists have any greater insight on this topic than Plato 2,400 years ago. And there are lots of contemporary philosophers who think just like me. If that's the case, then maybe life is not absurd. And maybe that God who gave us those desires intends to fulfill them. And maybe St. Augustine was right. For thou hast made us for thyself, he said. For thou hast made us for perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. For thou hast made us for you because you are, Lord, perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. And our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Maybe. If that's the case, then I'm afraid Nietzsche and Sartre were dead wrong. <laughs> and maybe Plato, Aristotle, and of course Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine, Bernard Lauder and Karl Rahner, they were more right, more complete, more lucid. Very possible. Or as we used to say in college, possibly. <laughs> Okay, let's go to the third quick explanation. There are a lot of people out there who have what I call Marxist views of history. These are the revisionist historian views. Religion has done so much harm, uh, so much more harm than good throughout the centuries. Can't you see what's going on in the Crusades? I mean, our president even dragged up the Crusade and the Inquisition. Okay, you got us. We there was some bad news going on over there, and there was some really... But are you kidding me? Religion, religion gave rise to the early societies, which gave rise to all the laws which protect us. The prophets were looking out after widows and orphans. I mean, are you aware of what Christianity has done throughout this? since the time of Jesus Christ? The Catholic Church, the Christian Church, has literally opened the door to public education. Do you think there was public education in any sense prior to the Christian? And by the way, opening the doors to the slaves? The, the Christian church educated so many Roman slaves that when they decided to persecute the Christians and they rounded up all the slaves to persecute them who converted to Christianity during the reign of Diocletian, do you realize they couldn't do it anymore? Because they were running out of people to run the Roman bureaucracy. Because it was the Christian slaves who could read who were running it. That was Christianity. What are you talking about? Do you, public health care. 
Who started? Not the Romans, not any second. These were Christians who extended their own health care system beyond their own communities in the first centuries of Christianity. I mean, social welfare, I mean, even the, the, the slavery, Roman slavery, comes under interdict. Finally, you know, and, and, and just the years of just breaking it, it apart. I mean, from health care to social welfare to education to the rights of slaves, Christianity or religion, prophets in Judaism, right, and so forth and so on, looking out after the widows and the orphans. You know what the largest international health care system is in the world today? Yep, the Catholic Church. You know what the largest international um, uh, public welfare system is in the world today? Yeah, just look it up. You can, you can Google it on, on Wikipedia. The Catholic Church. <clears throat> I mean, public education, public welfare, health care, international. I mean, it's amazing. When you look at the combined Christian effort toward abolition, you know, I don't want to get into the whole thing. What are you talking about? <laughs> Religion doing more harm than good. According to whom? And you, Karl Marx, should say that after you initiated and gave birth to Stalin? <laughs> and the Khmer Rouge? And all of your other ideologues who killed millions upon millions and millions of people? Are you kidding me? I mean, that kind of stuff really does tick me off. It is so ridiculous. But, Anyway, I, I, I belabor this point. Anyway. <laughs> Basically, I don't think any choice for AT the one, the two choices, the, the two things I really wish these Christians could do a much better job. We got to help the people who are suffering. And the second, uh, the one group I didn't take is this group of, of folks who really had a terrible experience of God, maybe from their childhood or their childhood school or their childhood parents, and somebody beat into the, their little heads, you know, when they were kids. You know, God's an ogre, and God's going to punish you, and God's going to send you to hell, and, you know, just go, you know, God's up there saying, Spencer, you know, heaven, hell, heaven, hell, oh, hell. You know, just, you know, just, you know, get down there. You know, and, and these kids, they grow up, you know, and, and literally, the, 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 you know, they're literally, they, they even hear the word religion, and, and just all these, these pains are, of, of pain and, and things are going off in their little heads, or now they're big heads, and, and of course, they are just violently angry at God and religion. And we got to do a better job introducing them to Jesus' notion of God, who, of course, is the father of the prodigal son. So I think, you know, I don't think you're going to convert a lot of Marxist atheists who want to do the revision system. I think you're going to convert a lot of people who are Nietzschean atheists who don't want any God besides himself. But I think the first group, the suffering group, and I think the, second, uh, the fourth group, the group that's just basically been, you know, kind of harangued by God since your childhood, I think we can do a lot to help those two groups because they're not in it because of a real choice. They're in it because of a default choice. They don't see why, you know, that they have to suffer. So I'll just leave it at that. But why, why are scientists atheists? Same four reasons, five reasons as, as the normal group. Let's quickly go uh, to the Bible and science, if I might, for, for just a, a few minutes because I, I think I'm probably an overtime. And I do want to get to your questions. I think there's four principles we just should be very, very careful of. Now, again, I'm giving the Catholic side of this deal, um, but um, there may be some Christian people here who may not agree with this, but um, uh, it, it is sort of our, our own Catholic uh, doctrine. Uh, the, the encyclical, that there's a, when, when a pope declares some end to a matter of controversy, Normally, he writes what's called either a papal bull or a papal encyclical. That means a letter which is being declared to resolve a controversy that's been taking place within a church. And, and there was a huge controversy about the Bible and science going back to the early 1940s, well, actually 1940 itself. And so Pope Pius XII came out and did deliver an encyclical letter called Divino Aflante Spiritu. Now, you can click on this in your Google, and you can get the whole text of it. Here's the summary. Point number one. The Bible is meant to give sacred truths necessary for salvation. The Bible is meant to give sacred truths necessary for salvation. Science is meant 
to take an empirical mathematical methodology to give a proper description and explanation of the natural universe. Very different. Two different things going on. So when God speaks to the biblical author, God's primary interest, said Pope Pius XII, was not to give us an uh, empirical mathematical method to resolve a proper um, you know, uh, physical uh, description and explanation of the natural universe. That's, that wasn't the primary objective of God. God's primary objective was to give sacred truths necessary for salvation. Now, when the Pope declared this, he basically was saying, let science be science and let the sacred truths of the Bible be sacred truths of the Bible. Don't force the biblical author to be a scientist or anything like a scientist because that means that God's intention was to make the biblical author a scientist or to give scientific data descriptions and explanations of the natural world, which it wasn't. Second point. The Pope then goes on to say there's two ways of looking at inspiration. Inspiration means when God comes to speak to us in our souls or comes to speak to the biblical author in his or in his soul in this case right comes to speak to the biblical author then it, it, he could either do it by what's called the dictation view of inspiration or the collaborative view of, of inspiration which one is it now you can imagine what the dictation view of inspiration is spitzer Take this down. Okay, in the beginning, there was a quantum cosmological configuration where the unified, all four forces were unified in a pre Big Bang state where quantum gravity was strongly interacting with the other three forces the electromagnetic, strong nuclear, and weak forces the first day. And then a a tremendous explosion occurred when that quantum cosmological configuration began to break down because it was metastable. And when that happened, there was a tremendous explosion. And then when that explosion occurred, the gravi uh, gravitational force, which was formerly quantized, rolled out into a space-time field, which became the space-time field of the general theory of relativity the second day. <laughs> then, the strong, then literally, the strong nuclear force spun off from the electroweak force. And of course, the third day, because of course, now the strong nuclear option was, was present, and finally you have the weak force rolling off from the electromagnetic force the fourth day. Then a Higgsian field is created from the remnant of the roll off of the weak force from the electromagnetic force. And as the Higgsian field rolls off all of the electromagnetic energy that's bursting forth from the release of the electromagnetic uh, force from the, the weak force goes through the Higgsian field and is slowed down. Slowed down so significantly that it takes on rest mass the fifth day. <laughs> and then you can see this biblical author going, by the way, what is stellar nucleus <laughs> physics anyway? And the point I'm trying to get to is it wouldn't, A, have had anything to do with the sacred truths necessary for salvation. And furthermore, for all intents and purposes, that poor biblical author wouldn't have understood a word of it, and neither would the culture that was supposed to be the recipient of that truth. What Pope Pius XII told us at that point is the dictation view of inspiration is simply not adequate to God's own purpose. It's not adequate. There's only one 
a view of inspiration that's adequate, and that's the collaborative view of inspiration. What does that mean? That the Lord comes down to the biblical author and does inspire the biblical author, but he makes use of the biblical author. So the, the biblical author is a collaborating partner. So he's making use of the biblical author's categories and the way the biblical author understands the world and the universe and the way in which the biblical author understands culturally what the world is like and so forth and so on. And he's going to make use of the biblical author for one reason only, or two reasons only, I should say. Number one, he wants to communicate truths of salvation, and he wants to communicate those truths of salvation in a language, in a culture, and in categories that the people around him can understand and will be valid centuries, millennia, from the point that he actually suggests it to the biblical author. That's the clever view. Why is that so important? Because whatever is received is received in the manner of the receiver, as St. Thomas Aquinas said a long time ago. Quid, quid, retributor, right? It's retributor and lower retributor. Yes. So whatever is received, is received in the manner of the receiver. What does it mean? If I tell you something in a language you don't understand, it will mean nothing to you. The only way you can receive it, internalize it, and make it yours is if the ideas and the language and the culture make sense to you. And that's what God did the collaborative view of inspiration. So, of course, last point, well, what was the biblical author up to? What was his problem? And as we said last uh, month, his problem was he had four really heterodox views that were contravening the sacred truths that God had revealed which were necessary for salvation. What were those sacred truths necessary for salvation? What was it? What were these four truths that the rival epic myths, right, like the Gilgamesh epic, right, that they were contravening, that were confusing the Israelite people? What were they? Number one, many gods. Israelites started to think, well, maybe there are many gods. Are. So the biblical God has to correct it's only one God. Number two, there are nature gods out there. Sun gods and river gods and sea gods and moon gods. But no, the biblical author says no, there's only one God and everything else is a creation of God. The moon is not a God. The moon is just a creation of God. Sun's not a God. Sun's a creation of God, etc., etc. Third thing, the rival ministers are saying matter is evil. The biblical author says no, it isn't. God made matter good. So every single day of creation, God sees that it is good. And finally, of course, the most probably important fact for our salvation, you are not mere cannon fodder and play things for the gods as they were in the rival epics of Gilgamesh and so forth. You are created and made in the very image and likeness of God himself with God's own spirit breathing through you, which doesn't mean just breath, which means your intelligence, it means your will, it means your creativity, and your five transcendental desires, a perfect unconditional truth on this. <laughs> Get the point? So that's what we as Catholics believe. It's in Divino Aflante Spiritu there, very important encyclical, very important distinction in the view of inspiration. We are not biblical literalists. We, we just aren't. But we, uh, we have a very sophisticated view of it. For those of you who are interested in such questions, I think to get the Jerome Biblical Commentary is a really, I mean, for, the, for some of the, um, the students here, this may be a stretch. But you know, as you get into your first, second year of college, this won't be a stretch. This will be an invaluable resource for reading the Bible in the future. You get so confused by so many passages. These are some of the best geniuses, you know, assembled by the Catholic Church, Raymond Brown and Joseph Fitzmaier, right? Some really impressively smart guys who are writing, you know, uh, some really impressive and good commentaries, easy to use. Uh, I would say, you know, take the 60 bucks and spend it. Uh, you, you couldn't do better than having a, a family of your own uh, Evolution really quickly, and then alien, aliens. 
Evolution is the same thing. Um, we, the same Pope, Pope Pius XII, he also wrote another encyclical called Humani Generis. Um, and um, in this encyclical, this is basically what the Pope said. You as Catholics can believe anything you want about evolution. Anything you want about evolution. So long as you do not deny the creation of a unique transphysical soul in every single human being. A unique transphysical soul in every human being. Frankly, after looking at the, the uh, data from near-death experiences, I don't have much of a problem with believing in a unique transphysical soul, even if I couldn't have known that through my faith. I have a pretty good idea. Something very strange going on out here, and physics isn't explaining it well. That's the point. That's the only requirement. You can basically believe in evolution as far and to whatever extent you like. The Pope recommends that you do this according to theories that have been very well scientifically verified. Now then, Pope, now Saint uh, John Paul II came out um, uh, in 1996 and wrote a very important um, uh, address to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. By the way, you can get this on our website, manchacenter.com. It's, it's right there. Or you can just Google um, John Paul II, uh, Evolution, Papal Academy of Sciences, to let it come right up. And, and in this, um, uh, John Paul II goes through and, and he makes, first he says, uh, this is an important thing. Evolution is more, today, is more than a hypothesis. He says we've reached the point where various parts of the evolutionary theory are corroborated by good science. It's addressing the Pontifical Academy of Science. A lot of Nobel Prize winners in that crowd. He knows what he's saying, and he's coming out. He's going beyond Pope Pius XII, he's saying it's more than a hypothesis. There is excellent corroboration for evolutionary theory in certain areas. So this is, a, by the way, I think Catholics should memorize this because when we get accused, right, of being, uh, frankly, somewhat blockheaded, you know, and, and, and uh, that we're you know, literally contra science, contra fossil evidence, contra genetic evidence, Contra geographical distribution evidence of evolution. You know, I mean, when we're exasperating scientific colleagues, I think we ought to memorize this letter of John Paul II and give it to them so they know, hey, we're not in that group. I mean, pretty much we think that this is actually a, a valid theory. Not everything in the evolutionary theory can be explained by science right now. For sure. The leap from non-living to living organisms. No way have we been able to explain this, either physically or in systems theory or anything else. There's something very weird going on there. There's some other kinds of transspecies things, which Stephen Meyer has written about in Darwin's Doubt, which are very interesting things. And of course, I think most of you know that the agnostic Thomas H. Nagel, right? Thomas Nagel, pretty you know, naturalistic agnostic guy, right? And he comes out and he writes this book on, on mind and, and, uh, and the universe and says, there is no way that a Darwinian theory can explain the kinds of leaps and the progress of species that have been made in the time parameters elucidated by the contemporary Big Bang theory. And he goes through it and he just says, I don't have an ax to grind here. I have no religious affiliation whatsoever, but Darwinian theory does not work in the time requirements uh, uh, allotted by the contemporary Big Bang theory, and it doesn't. This is a problem. So you can believe it if you want to, but there's a lot of unexplained points. Do, does evolution explain a lot of fossil evidence? It certainly does. Does it explain a lot of genetic evidence? It certainly does. Does it explain a lot of geographical evidence? It certainly does. Can we, uh, did we see a kind of a rollout from Australopithecus maybe, you know, to, to homo, um, you know, um, hobbyless, you know, to, to maybe, you know, Neanderthal, to maybe homo sapien? Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, there's, there's a lot of darn good evidence for this. 
You know, so I mean, for all intents and purposes, you're free to believe it. Enough said. Aliens. Last point here. Um, what are the odds that there is alien life out there? I would say if we're talking about elementary alien life, it's pretty good odds. Why do I think that? Because there's a billion trillion stars out there. A billion trillion stars. That's 10 to the 22nd stars in our observable universe. That's a lot of stars. Number two, uh, and they just happen to be in 100 billion galaxies, by the way, 10 to the 11th galaxies. A lot of stars. What about planetary systems? The new Kepler satellite, you know, everything has changed, everybody. Planetary systems are not nearly as rare as we thought. Uh, three weeks ago, Kepler identified a planetary system, which was a rocky planetary system, some of which had atmospheric possibilities, that was 10.1 billion years old. Our sun and earth are only 4.5 billion years old. What does that mean? That only means that there's probably a billion trillion planetary systems out there that might be able to sustain life, but some of them are like 5.6 billion years older than us. Interesting. Could they have developed life? Yes. Why? Because we live in a strong anthropic universe. What does that mean? We live in a universe where all of the constants have been fine-tuned for life. Where entropy, low entropy has been fine-tuned for life. The whole universe is fine-tuned for life. It's fine-tuned for planetary system evolution. Something might be out there. Can I be sure? No, I can't be sure. Is there any real evidence from the Mars lander, anything else about life? No, there, there, there isn't. That there's hints, there's clues, there's possibilities, but we're still awaiting a single piece of confirmed data. What about UFOs? You know, boy, you know, I, I don't want to put my my uh, my reputation on the line. You know, you know on, on, on UFOs. I, I just got to tell you, um, I just don't know. I don't know. Now, what am I saying? Is there a possibility of life? Yes, I think there is a possibility of life. But what about intelligent life like our own? In my view, and I haven't explained any of this, but I might explain some of it in the next two upcoming lectures. In my view, when you look at the kind of creature we are, when you look at the fact that we have self-consciousness, that's a big problem, everyone. Even David Chalmers today, right? Good old Oxford University, David Chalmers is calling the problem of self-reflectivity and the capacity to experience our experiencing the hard problem of consciousness which no physical, no physical process can explain. These, these are not Christians or religious people arguing this. Self-consciousness is a big, huge paradox, inexplicable in terms of quantum and normal physical systems explanations. It's very weird. You're able not only to know that the microphone's there, you're able to be aware of your awareness of the microphone. <laughs> not only that, you're able to be aware of being aware of your awareness. You can get yourself getting yourself getting the microphone. And when you can do that, you can create your own inner universe. That's something we're having trouble explaining any known physical or quantum system. Classical physical system is not quantum. Quantum physical system is quantum physical system. Different from classical. But we can't explain it. It's weird. There's this thing called Gerdel's theorem. That, uh, uh, you know, uh, this guy, Kurt Gerdel, who was a, a very important um, mathematician, intern mathematician, who basically showed that there can't be any Turing machine, right? Any artificial intelligence that can replicate human intelligence in mathematics. Because human intelligence can uh, does not have to appeal to a previous set of axioms in order to correct the axioms and move beyond the axioms it already knows. 
Human intelligence, mathematically speaking, is making recourse to some higher form of mathematical intelligibility, which is not explained by any set of axioms or algorithms. We're simply weird. We're ahead of any known set of algorithms defying all artificial intelligence. This is a huge problem. People like Roger Penrose, people like Stuart Hameroff, they take this seriously. These are not people who are dying to be religious. They're just calling it like it is. We're weird. Then you combine Gettle's proof, you combine that with the, the hard problem of consciousness and David Chomp, and then with the near-death experiences that we've just been through. I'm telling you, you are not atoms and molecules. You are something more, you're transmitary, and then you combine that with those five transcendental desires that you have an awareness of perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and hope, sufficient to recognize every imperfection in truth, love, goodness, beauty, and hope that you confront in reality. You are so transcendental. You're over the top transphysical. You've got some kind of weird soul. And I can tell you this right now, there's no physical paradigm that's going to be explaining this in the future. There's a, there's a great guy by the name of Sir John Eccles, who just, you know, he was a friend of Karl Popper's. He wrote this book called The Self and its brain. And you, I, I will give you the, the, the quotes if you're interested in it. But what's my point? The point I'm trying to make is, if you've got an alien out there who's anything like us, if you've got an alien out there, you encounter the alien, and you discover that alien is self-conscious, and then you discover they also defy Gettys theorem, and that they are capable of, of having trans-axiomatic, trans-algorithmic trans mathematical knowledge, and that they're generating theorems as fast as we are, and then you discover that they have an awareness and, and a desire for perfect unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and hope, and then you discover that they've already also had near-death experiences and confirmed them by valid studies. You know what? If you discover that kind of being, all I can tell you is they have a soul, and there's only one way they could get that soul. And that's not through some organic, biological, physical, evolutionary process. God gave it to them. And if God gave them a soul capable of knowing perfect gun con or awareness, perfect gun condition, truth, love, goodness, being, being capable of being self-reflective, capable of trans-algorithmic uh, mathematical thinking, and, and, and having near-death experiences, baptize them. Catechize <laughs> <laughs> them and baptize them. Because that's what God would want you to do. And I better conclude with that. Thank you very much. But I do really honestly want to take your questions. Well, last time the questions were so great. Fire away, and uh, I may not see you, so shout it out. Uh, my eyes are lousy, um, so. Uh, Please feel free to shout out as you wish. Sure, in the back. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to mic. In the, please, in the back. Well, I'd like to take a leap from what you just finished with. Sure. How does salvation history work into what you just finished your lecture with if the fall of man and the Garden of Eden occurred here on Earth, how does that translate universally when you said if you meet an alien, baptize them? Did they also, were they also part of the fall? Oh, I, you know, not, oh, it's a very good thing. Yeah, the question was, um, if there were an alien civilization, would they have also been part of the fall? Well, uh, first of all, you know, did they have an independent fall, or did they their fall be constituted by our fall? You know, and um, again, we know that we have come from a single um, female ancestor, right? Uh, every single one of us here has mitochondrial DNA, the so-called Eve gene. So we know that every single, there's one identifying factor in every single one of you. I don't care, Asia, Antarctica, you know, uh, 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 Latin America, uh, United States, wherever you come from, you've got mit mitochondrial DNA. You have uh, the, the gene remnant of your Eve ancestor. So, of course, one fall applies to us all. So, you know, she's asking a legitimate question. Well, wait a minute, what if you got a completely alien uh, civilization that 
doesn't have a common ancestor for the whole human race. Well, what, what, what happens then? You know, and the idea would be, well, let me put it to you this way. Every single time we've seen a self-conscious entity, every single time we've seen a self-conscious entity with the desires for perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and hope, every time we see one, they always get to thinking about something. The same question you see in that fall narrative in Genesis. I think I'd like to be God. And why not? Do you think that if there were another self-conscious alien civilization that they would not succumb to some form of narcissism? Some form of pride, some kind of egocentricity, some kind of envy, some kind of greed, some kind of I want to be better than you and I'll conquer you. Some kind Do you think they're going to... Me? You ask me? I think they're going to have the same fall we do. <laughs> now, that gets to your next question, which I'm sure you will ask if I, if I, if, if they fall, well, does Christ's event save them too? So when Jesus, the Son of God, comes to uh, this earth and, and, and incarnates himself in a finite condition in order to be Emmanuel, God with us, and then to make a perfect self-sacrifice, which he interprets as an unconditional act of love. Do you think that that would be sufficient if he did it here on earth for every other possible intelligent alien civilization in the universe? Yep or dipper? I do. <laughs> And the reason is, is Jesus' act of unconditional love is infinite. Just as the early missionaries thought, right? I mean, you, know, you have Jesus there in Jerusalem. And what was the first instinct of the church? To go and spread the good news to people who had not heard about Jesus. Because they knew that his self-sacrifice was an infinite act of love would apply to them as it would apply right, to the people who were closest to Jerusalem, closest to Rome. Then when the new world was discovered, it was the same thing, right? You, you went out, you had missionaries because they knew there were people out there who were self-reflective, who were musical, who was spot, they, had, they thought about God, they had spiritual instincts. They had moral instinct. They were thinking about goodness and so forth. You know, it's the same thing. All you need is one infinite act of love at one time. You might say, well, why was it on earth? Why wasn't it in another alien school? I don't, why was it in Jerusalem? Why wasn't it in Latin America? I don't know. But I do, because I can't read the mind of God, right? But I do know one thing. If you're going to become incarnate, you're going to have to subject yourself to the limits of space and time. That much I know. So you're going to have one incarnation in one particular place and one particular time. You're not going to have it in all particular places, in all particular times. Otherwise, Jesus Christ did not become pure, uh, a true man. He only became sort of like the appearance of men everywhere. But that's not what happened. He became like us. And that means Jerusalem got favored. Great for Jerusalem. But I'll tell you one thing. We all have the good news now. And we're all saved by it, irrespective of where Jesus was, because his act of love was unconditional. Would it apply to an alien civilization if one existed? Absolutely. That's why I said definitively, catechize them and baptize them right away. Tell them about the unconditional act of love that has been brought by Jesus Christ. Uh, no joke. I mean, that's, that's what I said. But uh, did you want to follow up? No, thank you. Doctor. Good. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, Father, I um, recently heard of a study that was done, and I think it was a physics journal or something, other, where they believe that the universe is was eternal, was always here, and never... Do you know the study I'm talking oh, yeah. about? Yeah. I'm curious... That if study, that were by the way, to be true, how, because you were saying the Big Bang is the reason for 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, to be honest with you, that wonderful study is really using data that's about 11 years old. And that uh, study was definitely uh, considered. Uh, those kinds of theories, these are called what's called static universe theories, okay? And the so-called static universe theory means that there's a quantum cosmological configuration prior to the Big Bang, which was supposedly, and here's the word, eternally static. But now, then we know one thing about that eternally static universe. So it's in a static state for an, etern for an eternity, and then it has to decay because that static universe has to explode in the Big Bang. Now here's the problem. And by the way, if you take a look at our website, where Alexander Vilenkin, the guy who's the second guy in the board of Lincoln and Guth Theorem, already answers as he goes to, with his graduate student, Audrey uh, Mathani, and the two of them show the quantum evidence that shows that a static universe is an impossible eternal configuration. Now there's a very good quantum mathematical reason for that that's on the website. Here's the logical problem. If you have something which is eternally stable, which is eternally static, then that means it must be perfectly stable. I mean, how else could it be static for an eternity, an infinite amount of time, right? It has to be perfectly stable. But if it explodes in the Big Bang, then it couldn't be perfectly stable. There has to be something in it, which is what we call metastable, so that that stability can decay to give rise to the Big Bang explosion. This is a contradiction. An eternally static universe, which gives rise to a Big Bang, is a perfectly stable, not perfectly stable universe. <laughs> That's a bad contradiction. That, by the way, was responded to 11 years ago, by, or not 11 years ago, nine years ago, 2006, by Alexander Blinken, and repeated in 2012 at Stephen Hawking's birthday party in Cambridge. For all intents and purposes, this is not a new theory. This is a rehab of an old theory which is as illogical and contradictory as it was when it was first formulated uh, 11 years ago. Very good, thank you. You're welcome. Here. Yes. Yeah. Father? Yeah. Um, is there a set of uh, a sample size who in near-death experiences describe something much different than the, the light, in other words, something a lot less heaven-like? Yeah, yeah. In about 1% of the cases, uh, there are people who uh, definitely recall um, hellacious uh, uh, experiences, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that are very dark, very threatening, very violent, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. About 1%. <laughs> I would say this. <laughs> just for all intents and purposes, just remember, well, when you're dying, always think of good, good old Goethe's Faust, right? Remember uh, the Dr. Faust, right, in Goethe? Um, he's a very important German uh, author. Anyway, uh, there's this. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, uh, you know, Mephistopheles is the devil, right? And he has gotten Faust to buy into, right, uh, a selling of his soul. So uh, Faust sells his soul to the devil, Mephistopheles, there, so that he can have fame and fortune, intelligence, and all these various things. And of course, at the end of the book, you know, um, uh, Mephistopheles has got Faust, you know, and Faust is squirming in his hands, you know, and of course, Mephistopheles is, is just rejoicing in his victory. And God snatches Faust because Faust says, help, help, help me, Lord. You know, he turns and he has this act of repentance at the last moment as Mephistopheles is gripping him down. And, of course, God grabs Faust because of his one imperfect act of contrition at the last minute. And Mephistopheles is angered and he just turns to God and I earned this. I got the contract. I fulfilled the contract, I bought his soul, and God says, no, he says, Faust is mine, heaven is my business, and souls are my business too, you lose, end of story. But I mean, that's the one thing to always think about, you know, when, 
My seventh grade teacher said, if you're going down in the plane, say your act of contrition. <laughs> and, and you know, that's a really good reason why I think God would save you. Just because you asked him. And he's unconditional love. Maybe we'll have time for one more question. Or the front row, there's another question. Yeah, yeah. but um, I was going to ask you another part, but I'm more interested in that. Yeah, uh, here, I'm going to answer both of them. Uh, God particle really quickly. The, the Higgs boson um, is, is, uh, has nothing to do with creation. I mean, nothing. Absolutely nothing. The Higgs field comes in the fifth era of creation. So it's not relatively late time speaking, but in terms of the uh, unwinding of physics, it, it, it's very late uh, in the process. And, and, the, and the Higgs boson is just an indication of a Higgs field. A Higgs field is created when the strong uh, nuclear force and um, uh, the weak force separate from the electromagnetic force. When this occurs, the Higgs field is created, and the Higgs field has the effect of slowing down the electromagnetic, the burst of electromagnetic radiation uh, that occurs during that era. And then, because it's slowing it down, it's giving it literally rest mass. In other words, the slowness um, uh, of, of the particle uh, over against the speed of light, which it used to have, the slowness of the particle uh, has the effect of, of rest mass, what we would call weight, right? Or, uh, you know, mass that will no longer allow that particle to be accelerated to the speed of light anymore. Uh, and I told you the story last time. It's a funny story of Peter Higgs going in to his editor and he wants to call his book the GD particle, right? And of course the editor says, Peter, you can't use the word D in the title of your book. And so Peter says, ah, just drop it and call it the God particle. No kidding. <laughs> That's how it got the name. It has absolutely nothing to do at all with creation and certainly not a replacement of God. Second question, purgatory. How do you reconcile it? Here is the problem. Remember when I said 85% of those kids have a near-death experience full on with God or Jesus? Yep, but only 20% of adults seem to have that. The question now remains, what happened to that other 80% excluding the 1% that have these horrific experiences? So what happens essentially to this other 79%? We don't know. We don't know why they don't remember. We don't know why they don't have to make a choice to go back or not to go back. You know, I always viewed it as I'm probably in that group destined for purgatory. I mean, honestly, I, I just think there's something about that where in, in you know, the adult uh, population, there is some purgation that still needs to be done. And purgatory, you know, is not a place of punishment. Purgatory is a place of purgation. And what that means is it's a place where we, we're not going to go to hell anymore. Right? We're destined for heaven. We're going to get to heaven through the grace of God. But there's some decisions we have to make over time in our freedom to sort of let go of egocentricity, narcissism, envy, whatever it is that is really obscuring our view of our capability to enter into an unconditional relationship of love in the messianic banquet in the kingdom of heaven. So essentially, Something's going on there, but I, my, my deep suspicion, though, of course, I couldn't possibly be certain of it, is somewhere in that 80% who are not seemingly going in the negative direction or going in the uh, absolutely positive direction. There's something going on there which is a state of unknown ambiguity as far as NDEs are concerned, but the church probably would say some of that is definitely the experience of purgation. Not punishment, just a way, the time, and the grace that we need to get over ourselves 
so that we can love as Christ loves. All right, well, um, thanks so very much, and come back. Again.